Given the nature of the crowd particularly, I need to point out that in addition to the door you came in, there is a fire exit off to the side, which we will not need to use at all. <laughs> um, uh, before we get started, I'd like you to please silence or turn off anything that would ding, ring, beep, or otherwise interrupt our proceedings. If you are not already on our public program mailing list and would like to be, please fill out the back of your survey with your address and email and we will add you. We will inform you of our programs where, as I said, this is the last of this spring, but we will start again in the fall. And we'll be glad to send you a brochure and inform you with reminders by email. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, let me just briefly tell you about the American Antiquarian Society. We're a national research library and a learned society uh, of pre-20th century American history and culture and a center of learning where people of all ages and backgrounds and professions come to study and discuss virtually any aspect of life before the year 1876. Beyond the door behind me are some four million printed items. They include books, pamphlets, newspapers, broadsides, manuscripts, and all kinds of graphic arts materials. We have the largest collection of printed materials printed before 1820, roughly two out of every three things printed. That's the largest collection of that kind of material anywhere in the world. Uh, this uh, society was founded in uh, 1812 by Isaiah Thomas, who used that press up there to help start the American Revolution. And our collection is a very democratic one. We collect the great works of literature, important government documents, as well as ephemera, trade cards, menus, advertisements, posters, dirty pictures, anything and everything that was printed before 1876. Here we have a very simple model. We either have it or we want it. <laughs> and as a learned society, we conduct a wide variety of programs about the early history of our country, including free public lectures like this one. If you'd like to learn more about us, please visit our website, uh, AmericanAntiquarian.org, and uh, come any Wednesday at 3 o'clock for special behind-the-scenes tours. Most of the programs and the services of the Society, uh, including our website, our access to the library, being a researcher here, and our re all of our re many of our resources and our public programs like this talk are available to you all free of charge. We consider this part of our mission. But we are also a private, nonprofit organization that relies on the generosity of our donors for our existence. Please consider it making a contribution to the society, either by sending us a check, contributing online, or dropping some cash in the box of software. Your support is very, very important to us. Thank you. Our speaker tonight, Nathaniel Philbrick, is one of those rare and wonderful individuals who manages to combine meticulous research with spellbinding storytelling. And these skills have made him one of America's greatest popular historians. He is the author of Bunker Hill, The Last Stand, Sea of Glory, and Why Read Moby Dick. And the subject of tonight's talk, Valiant Ambition. And we are selling copies of that book, and that will sign them after the lecture. His book, Mayflower, a story of courage, community, and war, won the Massachusetts Book Award for Nonfiction and was a finalist for both the Los Angeles Times Book Award and the 2007 Pulitzer Prize for History. However, Nat is perhaps best known as the author of the acclaimed international bestseller In the Heart of the Sea, uh, which won the National Book Award for Nonfiction when it was published in 2000 and was recently turned into a major motion picture directed by Ron Howard. Please join me in welcoming back to AS Nathaniel Philbin. It's really great to be here. I've been on book tour for five weeks, 
and um, I'm coming towards the end, and it's not a book tour until I've come to the American Antiquarian Society, so thank you all for coming. This is always a real highlight for me. And Valiant Ambition began, in a way for me, 25 years ago. We had moved to Nantucket Island five years before that. I was an English major in college, and Melville was my absolute favorite book of all time, and here I was in the port of the Pequod. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than this. And I became fascinated with the history of the island. How did it become the whaling capital of the world? And I would eventually write my first work of history as a way offshore, the history of the island through the whaling era. And it was while beginning research on that that I came across the book that pointed me in the direction I ultimately took with Valiant Ambition. It's Krev Kaur's Letters from an American Farmer one of the seminal books of the 18th century. It's 12 letters. Crevecourt was petty nobility from France, fought in the French and Indian War, afterwards ended up uh, living on, in the Hudson River Valley area, marrying an American woman and traveling widely in America, up and down the Mississippi River. He went to Nantucket several times. That's why I was reading uh, the book, three of the 12 letters concern the island. And this is a book, is a love letter to America. Uh, he, he, he was just amazed at this, this place where people from all different nations, different social backgrounds, economic backgrounds, were contributing to a society like and nothing he had ever seen before, the most prosperous, free society in the world. And uh, he famously asks, what is this American, this new man? And then it all changes with the final letter, chapter, uh, letter 12. His utopia is destroyed by the outbreak of the American Revolution. Uh, the, uh, the zealous patriots move into town and through the office of the Committee of Safety begin to interrogate all the landowners owner, as to their loyalties. And Krevkor's uh, like, well, why are we having a revolution? I love America. What is what, what's going on here? And he's, he, along with uh, many loyalist-leaning uh, landowners, are eventually hound, hounded out of town. He, he ultimately escapes to back to France with his son, trying to, to form a new life. And then this was a very different version of the American Revolution from the one I had grown up with. You know, I grew up with the sense of it was a bunch of uh, undisciplined, ideologically driven militiamen who banded together and improbably defeated the mightiest military power on earth and therefore threw off the shackles of British tyranny. You know, that's, that's the revolution. But what Crevecourt described was, was something completely different. Um, the revolution actually brought the end to the freedoms he had enjoyed. And in fact, the, the American people showed much more interest in fighting one another than the British. Uh, you know, this, so anyways, I realized, whoa, there is something here I need to investigate. And uh, my last book, uh, as, as was mentioned, was Bunker Hill. And uh, after, after finishing that book, I, I just knew I had to follow George Washington, where he was going to go next. This was not George, George Washington on the one dollar bill. This was not a state pragmatist, the rock upon which this nation would be built. This was someone who was in his early 40s, red-haired, and by name, natural temperament, aggressive. Uh, he, he was, there he was, the nine-month siege of Boston, and he wanted to attack the British, burn Boston to the ground if necessary, and end this with one stroke. And, and so, uh, I, you know, I wanted to find out where he goes next, what happens to him, but how to get at uh, the, the side of the revolution that Krevkor had shown me. Enter my mother, Mary Ann Dennis Philbrick. Uh, my mom was something of a renegade. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, when I was growing up, uh, she just uh, loved to tell people exactly what she felt, particularly if she knew they wouldn't agree with her. And uh, she smoked a pipe, which was always exciting after a dinner at a restaurant when my parents would light up. And she loved Benedict Arnold. She, uh, and I would say, Mom, what are you talking about? Benedict Arnold, you know, he, he's, he, he's the personification of evil. He is a traitor. And she said, no, um, 
he, he was one of our best generals, and uh, you know he had his reasons. He, he, you know he got a raw deal. Well, I am here before you tonight to say Mom had a point, and it actually was I realized Benedict Arnold was the person I wanted to focus on with Washington to get at uh, the other side of the revolution. The, the book begins uh, in the summer of 1776 with Washington dug in in New York and the high, high ground of, of Brooklyn after managing to get the British out of Boston. That, he's able to do that with Henry Knox brings the uh, cannons down from Fort Ticonderoga and they're put on the heights of Dorchester and the British have to leave. But now Washington has a much grimmer situation to face because the empire has struck back with a vengeance. 400 vessels crowd into New York Harbor, anchored on the western shore of Staten Island. 40,000 soldiers and sailors. This is, the, this, this is more people than in all of Philadelphia, the largest urban center in North America. Not until World War I would Great Britain mount a larger force, and Washington has to deal with it. And the British had the advantage of, of having navy. They had naval supremacy. And so Ad General Howe's older brother, Admiral Howe, uh, could move the soldiers anywhere they wanted. And, and here was Washington having to deal with this with his relatively untrained Continental Army. It would not go well for Washington. He would be completely outgeneraled by uh, General Howe in the Battle of Long Island, forced ultimately to retreat across the East River, then forced to retreat from New York, entirely from Manhattan Island, and in the fall, uh, late fall of, of 1776, driven across the breadth of New Jersey. Ultimately, he, he digs in on the Pennsylvania side, the Delaware. And this is a very difficult situation for America because the British now have a toehold on the, at the base of the Hudson River. And extending up, if you follow the Hudson straight north, it's navigable past Albany. If, once you get past Albany and take a slight jog to the right, there is the southern end of Lake Champlain, a river-like lake that extends more than 100 miles into Canada. It is corridor of water was absolutely essential to the, the, the uh, safety of the United of what, what was the, the newborn United States. Because this was a time before multi-lane highways, before there were no good roads anywhere. And the only effective way to move an army through the wilderness above America was by water. And as it was recognized on both sides that whoever commanded this corridor of water would determine the fate of, of what was going to happen next. If the British took it, they would be able to seal off New England from the rest of the states, and the revolution would be over in 1776. There was one, one general between that fate and, and America, and his name was Benedict Arnold. He was stationed with a fleet of 15 vessels, many of which he had built that summer in what's now Whitehall, New York, at the southern end of Lake Champlain. And he had to face yet another large invasionary, British invasionary force, this one coming down from Canada, led by General Carleton. He had, Carleton had thousands of soldiers, a large native contingent, transports, three cannon-equipped schooners, more than 20 gunboats, and uh, he spent six weeks to build the, you know, the, the, the 18th century version of the Death Star, a, um, a three-masted, square-rigged ship uh, with 18 cannons, the kind of vessel you see in the open ocean. This had sprung to life on Lake Champlain, and they were, and what Arnold knew was in the first northerly, they were going to start heading down with the hope of ultimately taking Fort Ticonderoga, crossing the Hudson, taking Albany, linking up with Howe, and ending this revolution. But Arnold had a plan. Uh, he, now his vessels were anything but modern, you know, the, the te technologically sophisticated vessels. You know, they had been constructed that summer, you know, hacked from the trees of the surrounding wilderness. They were basically floating platforms for cannons. 
and he had stationed his men inside Valcour Island on the west bank of, of Lake Champlain, just below modern Plattsburgh. And they had 15 vessels right across the mouth of that bay, with Arnold in the middle. He, the, the British set out in a northerly, they sail past Valcour Island, Arnold basically waits till they sail past a mile or so, then sticks out his head and waves, at least the moral equivalent, and the British go, aha, we've got the Americans trapped in this tiny bay. Little did they know that they were the ones about to sail into the equivalent of a trap. Because there was no one better than Arnold uh, in sizing up the strengths and weaknesses of the enemy. Already by this point, he had been the one who said, got to take Fort Ticonderoga because of this corridor of water. He had walked through with, uh, entered that with, uh, uh, by, beside Ethan Allen, taken that. Washington had sent him up to Quebec through the wilderness of Maine. You know, I, I followed Arnold's trail uh, by car. There's still nothing up there. And uh, it, uh, this was in the fall and winter of 1775. He would lose a third of his army to desertion and death. And, and death. They would stagger out of the wilderness and, and there they were at Quebec. He would, after this, he was known as the American Hannibal. And now here he was. Uh, waiting for the British. And now the British, and what he had done was the British now had to sail upwind to meet the Americans. And a large three, three masted square rigged ship cannot sail with any effectiveness against the wind. Arnold had found a way to neutralize the great advantage that the British had. He had created the, the nautical equivalent of the high ground. And only the, 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 the small gunboats that had oars could immediately come up to where Arnold was, and they would line up about 200 yards below Arnold, and they would just go at it for eight hours, firing their can cannons back and forth with Arnold in the bow cannon of his vessel. Uh, one British gunboat would be literally blown out of the water. One of Arnold's gondolas, uh, there, there is a, a a replica of one at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. They look like little uh, big rowboats uh, with a mast. One of those was sunk, a cannonball embedded in the fractured timbers of its bow. In the 1930s it would be raised and now is at the American Museum of History at the Smithsonian. Night comes. Somehow Arnold has, has fought the British to a, a draw, but he's in trouble. He's trapped inside Alcor Bay. It's it's very dark night. There's a mist on the waters, and Arnold's Arnold's officers are. How are we going to get out of this? Now Arnold had a swashbuckling essence to him. If there was a way, a risky way to do something that would add luster to his reputation as you know a, a general who makes it happen, he would go for it. And, and in this case, uh, his officers are saying, let's try to sneak around to the north. And, and he says, no, we're going to sail through the, the British and escape at night. And this is how we're going to do it. It's very dark night. If you look at the British line, uh, the, the vessel closest to the, the shore, there's space for, for us one by one to fit between the trees in that vessel. They won't hear us because we're all deaf after eight hours of shooting cannons. And if we go one by one, we're going to make it. Off they go, one by one, a lantern in the stern so the vessel behind can follow it, and they make it. That morning after the, the, uh, the sun comes up, the, the mist clears, and General Carleton is apoplectic. The fleet is gone. And he looks at seven miles to the south, and there they are, sailing towards Ticonderoga. A, a race uh, uh, occurs, uh, the wind shifts, all this stuff. Eventually, a day later, Arnold has sent most of the fleet on to Fort Ticonderoga, off of what's now known as Split, it was known then as Split Rock. Arnold has, a, has his version of a last stand, where he faces that three-masted ship, the two schooners, and for two hours he's fighting them off. Uh, so, his sail and hull is riddled with musket ball and cannonball holes. He's taking on water. And because he has oars, he tells his men, let's row for shore. The, best, the, the British ships can't follow him into the wind. And they ram onto the, 
the, the bank of what's now known as Arnold Bay, Arnold orders, orders his men into the high ground overlooking the vessel, and with the flag bravely waving, they blow it up. 4 a.m. that the next morning, Arnold and his men stagger into Fort Ticonderoga, and as his commander Horatio Gates will write to British General Philip Schuyler, no one has had more hairbreadth escapes than Benedict Arnold. The British, meanwhile, are what was that? They continue down to Fort Ticonderoga. They begin to look at the calendar. Hey, it's getting late. By November, this lake will begin to freeze. Maybe we should delay this till next year. They decide to do exactly that and head back to Canada. Arnold has done it. He has saved America in 1776. So my book begins with Washington, the man destined to be the one person capable of holding this country together at his lowest, and Arnold, the one destined to tear it apart at his highest. And over the course of the next four years, we watch what happens to them, ultimately culminating uh, in the summer, late summer of 1780 uh, with Arnold's decision to, to turn traitor and try to turn the fortress of West Point over to the British. Now, one part of, you know, many of us think that Washington, uh, you know, had a free hand in trying to win this war. But, you know, in many cases, his officers were by no means helping him. For example, during that terrible retreat across New Jersey, Washington, uh, you know, they're, the, the, they're being hounded by the British. Washington is at headquarters and receives a letter for his adjutant general, Joseph, Joseph, uh, Joseph Reed, a lawyer from Philadelphia. Thinking, uh, Reed's not in headquarters and thinking it's official business. He opens it up and finds out there's, some, there's something else about the, this letter. What he discovers is that Reed has been in correspondence with the second ranking officer of the American Army, Charles Lee, complaining about Washington's lack of decisiveness and suggesting that come winter, Lee go south and reform a new army. Washington discovers that while he's at the lo his lowest, the person upon whom he depends the most is basically scheming behind his back. This is where I began to fully appreciate that while Washington had his strengths as a general, it was as a politician that he was an absolute genius. He reseals the letter and writes a small cover note saying, while you were away at headquarters, I received this letter addressed to you, assuming it was official business, I opened it, realizing it's something else, my apologies. George Washington. <laughs> That's all he says. He leaves Reed the twist in the icy emptiness of his withheld wrath. And you know, Washington at, at Trenton and Princeton has the greatest comeback, you could argue, of all time. He manages to reverse the momentum of the war. but. The, the night before he crosses the Delaware, this is not looking like it's going to be the, the great comeback. This is looking like a last desperate uh, attempt that will fail miserably. The weather is horrible. Uh, it's, it's raining, it sleets, it turns to snow, it's blowing, there's a huge ice you know, coming down the Delaware River, and he's just hours from crossing the Delaware when he gets a letter from Horatio Gates. Horatio Gates is because the British have turned back to Canada, Gates and Arnold come down to join Washington with 500 soldiers that are a great help to Washington in the expedition ahead. And Arnold is, is, is told to go to Rhode Island where it's his job to try to unseat the British at Newport. Well, Washington is very hopeful that Gates, who was his adjutant general in Boston, will accompany him on this, this desperate attempt. Gates says, you know, I don't feel too, good, too very well. I think I better go to Boston for medical attention. Um, Gates goes there, but by this time the Continental Congress has relocated to Baltimore in fear that in the likely event that the British will cross the Delaware and take that city. And by also by this point, Charles Lee, uh, the, the second in command in the American Army, has been captured by the British meaning that Gates is right up there um, if there should be a change in leadership. And so Gates decides he's going to Baltimore 
And Washington learns of this just before he, he crosses the De Delaware, knowing that, that this general is positioning himself to be in a perfect position if this miscarries. And then he has this great success. You think this might have, you know, upped his stock with the Continental Congress. Not, not exactly. Now, um, the Continental Congress was, we didn't have an executive branch uh, during the revolution. They were running things, and they were, they did not have the power to, 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 to really run things. They, they did not have direct taxing power, um, and they also had a legitimate fear of the military. Because in every revolution in which a republic was the intended result prior to this, in the chaos following the revolution, what happens is, is the military co-ops the civil government. You know, Caesar had done it, Cromwell had done it during the English Revolution, Napoleon would do it in years to come, the French Revolution. And so Washington, after the great, great comeback at, at uh, Trenton, is the preeminent American uh, at, at this point. And, and some, particularly if you're a, uh, a, a delegate from New England, fear that Washington is becoming, his stature is becoming dangerously monarchical. And so they are very sure to, to maintain a lot of responsibility when it comes to running this war. And for example, they're going, they have the right to appoint Washington's major generals. That winter, in the winter of 1777, in their infinite wisdom, they decide that um, to institute a quota system by which each state gets two major generals. And since Benedict Arnold's, and by the way, Benedict Arnold is the highest ranking brigadier with the best record, bar none. But since Arnold's home state of Connecticut already has two major generals, he will not be elevated to, to major general, and five brigadiers below him will be promoted past him to major general. Arnold gets this news and does not take it well. No one would have taken it well. Washington, is, when he learns of this, is, is very concerned and writes Arnold saying, I don't quite know why this happened, but believe me, I will do everything I can to set it right. And this begins to turn Arnold. You know, by this time, he had, uh, dedicated, he had given much of his personal fortune to the American cause while he was in Canada. Uh, he's, he's, Turn back the managed to turn back the British at Valcour Island. You know why is he doing this? Because his own country doesn't seem to have any uh, appreciation for what he's doing. Let's fast forward a year to the October of 1777, the Battle of Saratoga. It's looking really good for the Americans. Brig uh, British General Johnny Johnny Burgoyne, Johnny Gentleman Burgoyne. Has, has, has managed to take Ticonderoga, no problem. He, they've crossed the Hudson, but now he has real problems. And it's not the American army that is his problem. It's the American wilderness. He's he, 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 maintaining a supply line already to, all the way to Canada. is proving impossible, and his, his soldiers are starving. If they don't take Albany quickly, it's all over. Meanwhile, thousands of New England militiamen are flocking to Saratoga, while Continental soldiers, including the Virginia riflemen under Daniel Morgan, have come up from the south. Horatio Gates is the commander, and his second command is Benedict Arnold. And Gates is concerned that it looks like we've got a potential victory here, but will Arnold steal the glory? After the first battle, the Battle of Freeman's Farm, Arnold's soldiers, the ones responsible for delivering a devastating blow to the British. In Gates' official account of the battle, Arnold is not mentioned. Arnold was a passionate man, uh, and which served him well in a battle situation, but not so well outside of that. He, you know, he was always running into trouble with his, his fellow officers and politicians, and Gates knew exactly the buttons to push. They have a violent argument, and Arnold is out of the Northern Army. The Second Battle of Saratoga, the Battle of Bemis Heights, breaks out. Arnold has no official role in the army, but that does not prevent him from appearing in the battle. He's a, a, a charismatic figure, and there are plenty of soldiers willing to follow him just about anywhere. It's done, the sun is about to set, and Arnold sees a way to end it. 
on the British right is a redoubt. If they can take this redoubt, if he can get through the, the rear of the redoubt while others attack it from the front, this will, this will, this will do it. Arnold sets out uh, between two lines of fire. He rides his horse through the sally port of the redoubt, his, his sword up and orders the, the soldiers to surrender. A German soldier raises his musket and fires the musket ball, hits him in the left thigh, splintering the bone into pieces, and kills the horse, which collapses on top of his injured left leg. He's lying there when a New Hampshire, young New Hampshire officer, Henry Dearborn, who has been with Arnold since uh, the march to Quebec, comes to his side and says, are you badly hurt? He says, in the left leg, I wish the musket ball had gone through my heart. He was so filled with anger, pain, sadness, and despair that, and hey, if he had gone then, he would have been one of our greatest heroes of the American Revolution. Instead, um, Horatio Gates becomes the hero of Saratoga. Arnold is uh, relegated to a hospital bed for the next four months, uh, immobilized with the equivalent of a medieval torture device on his, his fractured left leg. It's known as a fracture box. He's so immobilized he can't even write letters. And Arnold's physicality was absolutely essential to him. And he broods. He's very angry. He tells Lafayette that Horatio Gates is the greatest poltroon in the world. And, you know, this is, and, you know, he's not only destroyed physically, uh, because when the, when the leg that emerges from the fracture box will be two inches shorter, uh, it will be more than a year before he can walk unassisted, more than two years before he can ride a horse. But he's also psychically devastated. The Congress is shamed into restoring him to his proper rank, but it's too little too late. Meanwhile, Washington has been suffering the series of reversals that result in the British taking Philadelphia at, at Brandywine and Germantown. By this time, uh, the British are in Philadelphia. Washington is, is, is there at Valley Forge suffering through that terrible winter. And Gates has come down, the hero of Saratoga. Uh, those, those New England delegates begin to say, hey, you know, look what Washington did, look at what Gates did, should we be changing horses here? Uh, Washington staves it off brilliantly with those political uh, powers. Uh, it's known as the Conway Cabal, and ultimately he emerges from that winter stronger than ever. But not, not, uh, not Arnold, who uh, eventually comes to Valley Forge that May. By this time, the French have entered the war in part because of the great success at Saratoga. Uh, the, the, the British, because of this, it's now a world war, uh, are forced to evacuate from Philadelphia so they can consolidate their forces in New York. And Washington feels bad for Arnold, who he's, he's given an epaulette from the French, um, you know, one of a, a very treasured gift. And um, Philadelphia is now torn apart. The, the patriots uh, who were forced out of the city during the British occupation, are now returning and are not happy uh, with those Americans who chose to stay in Philadelphia. There's literally fighting in the streets. And Arnold cannot serve in an active command. Washington decides, well, how about you become military commander of Philadelphia? Now, in retrospect, it was a terrible decision because to be a mili military commander of Philadelphia in 1778 required someone with infinite patience and tact. This was not Benedict Arnold. Soon he's embroiled in all sorts of controversy. He's, he's becoming a lightning rod between a battle between the Continental Congress and the state of Pennsylvania. And guess who's the new head of the state legislature? Joseph Reed. Uh, he over, he's the prosecuting attorney uh, that sees that uh, two Quakers that are accused of collaborating with the enemy are hanged in the common in Philadelphia. Uh, something violent, uh, petitioned by thousands of people don't do this, but you know, he, was, he was going to root out any potential disloyalty. Arnold, who always had aristocratic Tensions aligns himself with the conservatives who are saying rather than weed out, you know, every American of, of 
you know, suspect loyalties. Let's just kind of make it work. Anyways, he, Arnold gets in the middle of it. Reed gets word that Arnold, who is now, you know, needs money, is, is, has all sorts of shady business deals going on. Reed gets wind of it, even though he has no evidence. He conducts a witch hunt, which ultimately results in Arnold having to endure through a court martial. Arnold is not happy, but he has fallen in love. Arnold is a widower with three, three kids, three boys, and he meets 18-year-old Peggy Shippen, half his age. Uh, she, uh, she was a great beauty. We know this because during the British occupation, one of the British officers, uh, John Andre, did a, a sketch of her. It's in the book. And uh, she very much enjoyed socializing with the British officers during the British occupation. Her family had royal connections prior to the revolution. Her father is now trying to straddle the political fence as best he can. Eventually, she and Arnold are married. And within a month, Arnold sends out his first feelers to the British government to none other than Major John Andre, who becomes the spy chief in British-occupied New York. Now, I will not go into the cloak and dagger uh, that unfolds over the next year and a half uh, as Arnold works out the terms by which he will attempt to surrender West Point, of which he gets command to the British. That's why you have to get the book. <laughs> But I will say that by the summer of 1780, America had cratered. Uh, the American people had launched into this revolution because they did not want to pay taxes to the British government. And now they didn't want to pay the taxes required to pay for the army required to win their, win their independence. Washington did not have food, clothing, anything for his army that was just withering on the vine, mutinies breaking out. The great fear was that if Washington should somehow manage to, to defeat the British, would there be a country left to declare victory? Arnold uh, decides that the best thing a true patriot can do is bring the British back as bloodlessly as possible and restore the liberties that we once enjoyed before the revolution. This, however, does not prevent him from negotiating the absolute highest price possible for his turning over West Point to the British, you know, ultimately making his act of treason reprehensible. There was more than a, you know, Arnold had that ability uh, to convince himself that what was, was good for him was good for everyone else, and this equipped him well to be ultimately a traitor. You know, you can't make this stuff up at midnight, uh, in late September of 1780, Andre and Arnold meet at midnight in a grove of trees on the west bank of the Hudson. Andre has been delivered up the Hudson in the most appropriately named British vessel ever, the HMS Vulture. <laughs> Arnold gives Andre um, documents related to the security of West Point. That, that dawn, the next morning, unknown to Arnold, an American officer has moved a cannon to the tip of Teller's Point and fires on the vulture, which is forced to sail down the Hudson, leaving Andre without a way home. The next night, Andre crosses the Hudson on the ferry and is forced to make his way through Westchester County. Now, Westchester County was at this point uh, known as the neutral ground where uh, this was an area between British-occupied New York and the Americans to the north, where no army held sway, and where packs of gangs, if they were patriots, they called themselves skinners, if they were loyalists, they called themselves cowboys, and packs of gangs where they literally raped and pillaged their former neighbors until this was, on, uh, many of the houses were vacant, uh, truly haunted, Area. Now, this is the place of Sleepy Hollow, Rip Van Winkle, and the Headless Horseman. And through this, this wasteland, Andre must make his way back to British-occupied New York. It's dawn. He's on his horse. He's getting close. He's only within a few miles of New York. When out of the shadows step three men with muskets, one of them wearing a Hessian Jaeger coat. Uh, Andre is ecstatic. He says, are you from the lower part, meaning uh, 
New York? And they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, well, I'm a British officer. And they say, get off that horse. It turns out that these are three American militiamen. And the one with the Jaeger jacket had been a prisoner in New York and used that jacket as a way to, to escape New York. Uh, they discover uh, the docu Arnold's documents in his sock. And it takes more than a day uh, for word of Andre's capture to reach Arnold at his headquarters a mile below West Point on the east bank of the Hudson. Washington is due to arrive any minute. Uh, Washington has been in Hartford meeting with his French counterpart Rochambeau. He's with Hamilton, Lafayette, Knox. He's due to arrive any minute when Arnold gets a message saying Andre has been captured. They haven't put two and two together yet, but he knows it's going to happen. He rushes up to their bedroom upstairs where Peggy is with their newborn son, tells her what's going on. He rushes out of the house, down to the dock, gets in his barge and orders the oarsman to row south. Eventually he will get to the vulture and back to safety in British-occupied New York. Washington arrives soon after. And after a, a tour of West Point where he wonders where is Arnold, he returns to learn that one of his best generals has attempted to turn over West Point to the British. He turns to Lafayette, the young French general who has become a surrogate son to him, and says, whom can we trust now? Now this is just a devastating blow. Eventually, Major John Andre would be hanged as a, as a, a spy, and Arnold would become a brigadier general uh, in the British Army. And, uh, you know, and the, the great irony, the tragic irony of Arnold's life, you know, he was a hero to the American people in the first years of the Revolution, but it is as a traitor that he truly galvanizes this nation where he is burned in effigy in towns up and down the, east, the eastern seaboard. Uh, I was speaking in Mystic, uh, Connecticut, where and talked to uh, someone from his his hometown there in Connecticut, uh, and recounting how when this news came that, that a mob went into the graveyard and took the, the gravestone of his father, pulled it from the ground. And, um, and, and so what I'd like to do is end by um, uh, reading a few paragraphs from, oops, from the epilogue that speak to how Arnold in, as a traitor, uh, would uh, actually have a profound effect on how Americans think of the mythology of this nation. The United States had been created through an act of disloyalty. No matter how eloquently the Declaration of Independence had attempted to justify the American rebellion, residual guilt hovered over the circumstances of the country's founding. Arnold changed all that by threatening to destroy the newly created republic through, ironically, his own betrayal. Arnold gave this nation of traitors the greatest of gifts, a myth of creation. The American people had come to revere George Washington, but a hero alone was not sufficient to bring them together. Now they had the despised villain, Benedict Arnold. They knew both what they were fighting for and against. The story of America's genesis could finally move beyond the break with the mother country and start to focus on the process by which 13 former colonies could become a nation. As Arnold had demonstrated, the real enemy was not Great Britain, but those Americans who sought to undercut their fellow citizens' commitment to one another. Whether it was Joseph Reed's willingness to promote his state's interests at the expense of what was best for the country as a whole, or Arnold's decision to sell his loyalty to the highest bidder, the greatest danger to America's future came from self-serving opportunism masquerading as patriotism. At this fragile stage in the country's development, a way had to be found to strengthen rather than destroy the existing framework of government. The Continental Congress was far from perfect but it offered a start to what could one day be a great nation. By turning traitor, Arnold had alerted the American people how, to how close they had all come to betraying the revolution by putting their own interests ahead of their newborn countries. Already, the name Benedict Arnold was becoming a byword for that most hateful of crimes, treason against the people of the United States. Thank you.